Hello and welcome to Toolbox Talks on the Sideshed. Just a quick shout out to your old mate from Australia who left us a five-star iTunes review uh, saying, this guy knows his stuff. <laughs> Thank you, your old mate. That is good to know. Well, welcome. You are joining us today for episode one of the How to Stop Competing on Price and Get Paid for Bids, Quotes and Proposals series that I'm conducting with my co-host, Greg Hamlin from Builders Profits uh, and Trades Coaching. This is episode one and it is called how to stand out from your competition. So enjoy. Giving tradies and contractors around the globe the tools to run a modern business. You're listening to Toolbox Talks from the Site Shed. Now here's your host, Matt Jones. Hello listeners and welcome back to Toolbox Talks from the Site Shed and you're joining us today for part one of the How to Stop Competing on Price and Get Paid for Bids, Quotes or Proposals series that I'm conducting with my co-host for this series, Greg Hamlin. Greg, welcome to the microphone. Hey, how you going, Matt? And Greg, you're from tradescoaching.com. Yep, coaching.com and we also have buildersprofits.com as well. Cool. Tell us a little bit about each. Okay, so yeah, the tradescoaching.com, that's mainly our, our coaching and uh coaching portal and that for the general trades and contractors around the construction industry and that. And the uh, Builders Profits, part of the reason we started that off was uh, one of the guys I was working with in the the, uh, construction area were having uh, issues, I suppose, with the guys one step above, which are the builders. And I thought if we can fix the builders, we can uh, certainly fix help the trades guys out. So we (laughs) we, uh, put the uh, Builders Profits together as more of a training portal and we've got the coaching side and the on the trades coaching side of things oh beautiful fantastic yeah look we've got a lot of uh inquiries on the show uh in in the area which we'll be talking about so well i mean we've had a few inquiries about how to how to stop competing on price and we've had another another bunch of inquiries on how people can you know start charging for quotes and all that kind of thing so i'm i'm pretty keen to dive into this series and i suppose get your uh get your take on on how we can resolve those sort of issues. So we've broken this series down into three separate episodes. And in the first one, we're going to be talking about how to stand out from your competition. Um, In the second one, we're going to be talking about how to qualify prospects to stop wasting your time. Uh, And the last one, we're going to be talking about how to get paid for bids, quotes, or proposals. Why have you decided, Greg, to, um, I suppose, break this series down into those three specific areas? Yeah, I suppose the main reason is, uh, you know, if you... If you go through a process, it's like mapping out any sort of process, but mapping out a process of being, okay, how do you position yourself as being the person that stands out mm. uh, so that you don't have to compete on price? And then then it's a little bit of a mind shift because a lot of people tend to be doing the same thing as everybody else. They go and photocopy somebody else's business and they go, okay, well, you know, I'll go out and do that. And you know, they tend to be, uh, I suppose, competing on price all the time. And, and uh, you know, I, I'm in agreement that you know your time is valuable, so you should be getting paid for your time. So, so these guys that go out and do all these free quotes, they, they should be paid for that. So that's why I thought, you know, let's show them how they can stand out from their competition first. Uh, then, you know, really get into, you know, um, you know, qualifying your prospects and making sure that the prospects are the people you should be talking to. And then when you're doing it, you're going out and making sure you, you know, you're presenting your quotes or your bids or your proposals out with the right people. Yep. And, you know, potentially get paid for them rather than being, being doing it all for free. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm really looking forward to getting uh, getting to that final episode. And I know a lot of the listeners will be. So we've we've done a couple of uh, episodes. Well, we've done one specific episode on that, but this would be a good follow-up to it. So I'll be looking forward to hear what your take is on that. So we may as well dive into the first episode here, which is um, how to stand out from your competition. Um, so who are we talking to in this episode, Greg? Basically, anybody that's really a, a, a contractor or a or a builder, yeah. uh, it's it really anybody that's got a business because you've really got everybody's got to stand out from their competition. Yeah, and uh, you know part of that is we talk about the buyer's journey and the, the buyer's journey. You know, a lot of people think that uh, you know they should be just diving all over the first person that comes to their business, but at the end of the day, it, it, it is a journey. You know, people start out. You know, there's future buyers, and let's say for the for the building space for start for for instance, people wake up on a Saturday. Day morning, they go, oh, look, honey, I want to go out and uh, have a look at a, a few places down the display village and get a bit of an idea from a kitchen or something like that. Um, you know, they're just initiating their first part on the buyer's journey. So that's really the future buyers. Yeah. Then you've got those people that move along that buyer's journey into the, the soon buyers, and they're really looking at the benefits of, uh, sorry, the overcoming objections. So the first group are looking at the benefits of ownership. The second group is really looking for, for overcoming objections. You know, I, I don't, do we really need? 
need to do this now and you know mm-hmm. how much value is it really going to add to my house and that sort of stuff and then the third group are the now buyers and that's where we we, we talk about having standards guides and how to choose you over your competition and that sort of stuff so yeah okay I suppose the first step is really understanding that buyer's journey. I'm curious, like, why why do you apply this mythology? I mean, it, it, obviously, it's a bit of a paradigm shift. Why have you sort of decided, well, you know, in your coaching programs, why have you chosen this? Okay, well, I suppose the main thing is um, at the end of the day, you know, a lot of people are out there, even though the things are booming at the moment, there's plenty of leads coming in and there's all that sort of stuff, but they seem to be wasting stuff so much time and get not getting back on quotes. They're unreliable in a lot of cases and that sort of stuff. So a lot of this sort of stuff is to be able to help the guys become more focused on how to get better results in their business. Yeah. Okay. So why don't we talk a little bit about, I suppose, the, I mean, what we're talking about here. When we talk about standing out from our competition, what what yeah. specifically are we talking about? I mean, I'm, I'm guessing we're not talking about walking around in uh, bright, bright fluoro pink uh, <laughs> uniforms, right? <laughs> yeah, no, exactly right. No, we're actually talking about really having a point of difference. And, and what I mean by that is you imagine um, going and buying a car, you know, you go to any car yard, let's say you're buying a new car and you go to a you know, Holden dealer or a Ford dealer, it depends on where you are, yep. you know, you go to a certain dealer, you know, the first thing most people do is they have a look on the web and they go, okay, that's the sort of car I want to do, buy. They'll go down and they'll talk to the dealer and uh, they might take it for a test drive and then they'll come back and go, you know, how much can is the car worth? And they'll twist their arm and that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. Now, the main reason that happens is because there's no real point of difference and because the car's made in the same factory. Right. Right. So when you're looking at a, a builder or a contractor, you know, if their business all looks the same and people can't see any differi- differentiation in value, so if they can't see a value proposition, all they've got to argue with is price. And this is, is why you end up with so many price shoppers. Yeah, okay. So it's really about having a point of difference, something that stands out. And you know, people will say, you know, we do quality, we do a great price, we're on time. Now, these are all platitudes. And, and what yeah. I mean by a platitude, I expect that. I'm a customer. Like, yeah. you, Matt, you, you go and buy something, do you expect it to be good quality? Exactly. Yeah, of course. Right? And do you expect it to be a good price? You, you want to hopefully get a good price for it. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, if you're doing some sort of building in that, you want it to be on time. So all those are sort of, you know, platitudes. It's, yeah. it's what you expect. So as a, as a, uh, a supplier or a contractor, builder and contractor, you've really got to be able to prove that you've got some sort of point of difference, something that's going to show you you offer more value than the next person. It's funny um, It's funny because it's kind of very similar to what we preach a lot in niching yourself and how you, you know, if you, if you try to be everything to everyone, you're not being nothing to anybody. But I suppose more importantly, you know, how you can, how you can stand out from your competition by targeting down on a specific area of your industry and sort of becoming the expert within that realm. Yeah, yeah, and I agree with that. I mean, over the years of coaching and that, I've found that, you know, it's great to niche businesses and we have, you know, that's why the builder's profits and that's why the trade's coaching. We've niched our business. We've got a, a quite a few different points of differences in our business. But, you know, initially you start with, you know, niching your marketing first and then start to look at uh, niching um, niching your business once you make sure you've got some business coming in, make sure there's a decent market there. So Yeah. But, yeah. yeah, it's one of those things, isn't it? I mean, it, it's it's often a hard thing to try and communicate to, to people, but, I mean, the reality behind the situation is, you know, if, if you're not applying, I suppose, resource into uh, targeting a specific area of, of that niche, it's extremely hard for you to market yourself as somebody that does everything. However, if you're somebody that specializes in something, it will very often get your foot in the door and give you the opportunity by where you can then uh, cross-promote the other things that you can do. Yeah, that's right. And, and um, you know, if you target one market, and it's part of, I suppose, the second part of this is understanding what we call the 3M or the marketing um, triangle, yep. um, you know, if you target your market right and get that message right and you find out the medium, then you, your marketing will work for you. And we'll, we'll jump into that in a little bit deeper. But going back to the point of difference before we go on, you know, you've got to have something that really stands out. Um, you being niche is a is one point of it. You know, being people pay more for the um, the professional, of the, the person that's they'll pay for the expertise. And normally, when I talk to people about putting their prices up and that sort of stuff, the first thing they do is they grab their heart and start rolling around on the floor. And I'm competing on price already. How the hell can I put my price up? And, and um, you know, it's really at the end of the day, 
when people uh, look at the other side of it, people get what they pay for on the other side of it. So if you're always out there doing cheap, uh, doing a cheap job, people see things they associate cheap with nasty, if you know what I mean. So a good example of this is like a builder of, uh, I've been working with for a while, you know, he's in the uh, southern suburbs of Sydney and he's going, you know, I can only, I've got, I, I was been doing, charging out, you know, putting 10% and 12% on my margin. I'm going, what, uh, on my markup, I'm going, what the hell? <laughs> You're not making any money. Yeah. By the time you do that, he's not taking wages, he's not doing anything like that. I mean, you've got to have a point of difference. So just because you're doing cheap doesn't mean you're going to win the job. So I actually got him to put his margin up, oh, sorry, his markup up to 20%. Yeah. And uh, he won a job within two weeks of doing that. Yeah, because right. It's a different perception, you know. Uh, but uh, anyway. What about where like where we would apply this sort of thing? I mean, point of difference, obviously, um, I mean, it's quite a broad a broad paradigm we're, we're addressing here like where would you actually apply that mantra within a business yeah mainly around your marketing um but to have a point of difference here's the thing you know there's a inside perception to outside reality uh, sorry inside reality to outside perception i mean that. yeah so basically when you're looking at a business your marketing's what's giving you that persona out there when you market and that's why people do free quotes and everybody's got those and, and we'll talk about yeah, more of that in the third session, but really, you know, everybody does free quotes, everybody does on time, everybody does on on budget, that sort of thing. But what you perceive, what your inside reality is, you might do a better job, right? You might do it better, quicker, and that sort of stuff. But your marketing's giving that outside perception of being the same as everybody else. Yeah. So that, and so that's where I say mainly, you know, ideally you want your inside to be really a point of difference. You really do want it to be on time. You really do want it to be good quality, but your marketing's got to show, because that's what everybody else says, your marketing's got to show something that's a point of difference. And that's where I say, you know, get your marketing right first, because there's two keys to freedom, in my opinion, is marketing and sales. If you can't market, you don't have a business. If you can't sell, you don't have a business. Yeah. You can do all that other stuff. Go. They teach you how to deliver at TAFE. You know, when you're getting your license, they deliver you, teach you how to do that. And most people are good at that, you know, but it's those other two that are the keys to freedom. So if you can get those right, yeah, and that's why I say, yeah, it's really inside the business. It's one of those things we, we, we try so hard to communicate to, you know, our, our clients and potential customers, you know, that when you're looking at, I mean, in this day and age, you really, really, your, your website really does sort of form the foundational product for your marketing. And I mean, I don't know if you teach a similar mindset in your courses, Greg, but, you know, we like to make sure that, you know, when guys are in that space of, of marketing, that they're doing it in a way that they can control it. And typically, you can only really control what you own, which is more often than not your website. You can't control, you know, social media and you can't control all this other stuff. But, you know, if you can build that solid structure and that foundational product well, um, then that really does form like basically the marketing launchpad for your business. Yeah, it's the platform that is, you own the uh, own that uh, real estate, as, yeah. as they say. You know, if you own that real estate, like you said, Facebook and, I mean, you look at what happens with Google every now and then when I can yeah. remember back, a few years ago with the Google slap and all that sort of stuff, yep. you know, when people lost businesses, on online businesses, yep. because Google stopped the way they did marketing. And yeah. So I think that's a pretty important thing to communicate. You know, if it's it's really, at the end of the day, just make sure whatever you're doing that when you look, I suppose, back at it, are you in control of what happens here? And yes, of course, you know, you're going to invest time and you're going to invest money into, you know, you know, other avenues like social social media or it might be, you know, paid marketing or whatever it is. But at the end of the day, if all that fell over, would you still have something there that you can own and control? That's right. And and, and part of, um, I suppose, I was saying about the two keys to freedom, sales is another area. We talk about having control of the process, mm-hmm. right? And so you, you're talking about the website. You have control of your marketing there in the sales section that we'll be doing the next, next um, thing is about owning control of the process. Well, when, yep. Sorry, when you're getting paid for quotes, it's about owning control of that process. So I agree with you. You know, if you and it's not because I'm a control freak or anything like that. It's just you know you don't want to leave your marketing or your or your uh, sales processes or all that sort of stuff or your business to chance. Yeah, you don't want to leave it to somebody that's like YouTube. Uh, Facebook, uh, Google that can turn in, turn the tap off straight away. I mean, and the other thing as well, just just be considerate, I suppose, of 
like take into consideration the whole ecosystem that surrounds that dynamic of marketing. And, you know, if you're going to invest in all this money into Google AdWords and do all this stuff, you want to make sure that you're doing it in a way that's driving people back to your website that you own so that then you can have that person enter into your database, by which case you can communicate with them, not necessarily through paid ads. Because, I mean, as soon as your budget runs out on paid ads, you fall off the face of the internet. So, you know, you just got to be smart about how you how you strategize that approach. No, I agree with you, yeah. yeah. Um, Greg, let's talk about the 3M triangle. The three, yeah, the marketing triangle. Now, that's been around since, uh, well, Dan Kennedy for so over 40 years, you know. Yeah. It's a simple form of marketing, and I think in a lot of ways people try to overcomplicate things. And, and the 3M or the three, yeah, three M triangle. Yep. It was really about your target market or your market, your message, and your medium. Yeah. And so you know, really identifying who your target market is, and we'll talk. I'm going to probably come back to the target market because it's really quite important to cover yep. for the rest of the series as well. But so you've got to identify your target market, who they are, and um, and uh, what you know where you find them. But the next part is the message, and the message really is really. Well, let me go through the whole triangle. The, the target market and your m- message and your medium, if you get all three of those right, your marketing will work on any platform. If you get any one of those things wrong, so if you're doing messages and you haven't identified your target market, you're just wasting money sending stuff out to people that are not going to read your message. Mm-hmm. If you know who your target market is and you've got your message right and you've got your and you've got your medium wrong, let's say you, um, you're targeting 70-year-old people that you don't find on Facebook, Instagram, and all those sort of things, <laughs> well, you've got, got your medium wrong. You're not going to get them. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's why I'm saying, you know, you, it's just a waste of money if you, don't under, if you don't get all three of these right. But when you get all three of these right, it's kind of the, the sweet spot. You, if you can get your target market right and identify who they are um, and then get your message right. And the message is really you've got to interrupt them. It's like a newspaper. You know, you, you read the, the newspaper, the headline's the thing that stops them and interrupts them and gets them to want to read more. Mm-hmm. So your message has got to interrupt them. And, and a, a friend of mine gave me the analogy of, uh, you know, imagine you're trying to stand across the Harbour Bridge at peak hour in the morning. You've got all that traffic flying past and you've got to interrupt somebody to, to stop and take note of your adver- advert that you've yeah. got on the on a billboard. How are you going to do that? The only real way you're going to do that is jump out in the middle of the traffic because nobody's really going to stop and read it. And that's the thing now. I've, I've been told, you know, um, We've seen more than 3,000 messages a day, you know, marketing messages from radio, billboards, um, newspapers, all the media, all the different media types. That means there's so much messaging out there, you, your message has got to stop and interrupt these people and get them to read more. Yeah. So you've got to get a – and so with, with that, I talk about a, like a loop-style headline, a question-style headline or something that's going to get them to want to read more. Then the second part of your message, you've got to get them engaged because same as a newspaper, if you – read the headline and you start to read that first sentence and if you're not engaged, you're just going to keep turning. You're just oh, that's not what I want to keep mm-hmm. reading. So you've got to get them engaged. You know, look at the benefits of ownership, the benefits of why they should be using you and that sort of stuff and, and really looking at not features. I mean, in a normal ad, people talk about we do free quotes, we do seven days a week, we do all that. What's in it for me, the person that's reading? It's, yeah. it's that old WIIFM thing, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to get engaged. I want to understand what's the benefit for me reading that. What's Why do I want to know more about it? And then the, the third part is really educating, you know, really, you know, educating them that you're the best choice, why you should be the person they choose. And that could be simple things like before and after photos. It could be Case studies. testimonials. Yeah. Yeah, and those sorts of things, just getting stuff in there, years in business, you know, but don't be too much we focused. When you're educating them, it's about showing them the benefits of ownership again. Yep. And then the last part is the offer, you know, getting that offer in place, um, getting them, uh, it's normally a low value or a low risk first step. And yeah, you know, free ebook or whatever. Yeah, so on your website, so, you know, what's your lead map? Magnet, as we call it in the industry, I suppose. And yeah. those guys, you know, you, you'd know about lead magnets, but some of the guys I talk to don't really know what a lead magnet is. But it's about having some sort of downloadable resource or some sort of thing that's going to get them onto the buyer's journey. And that's really what it's all about is you just want to get them to take that first step in a low-risk sort of way to get them onto the buyer's journey. Yeah. And I suppose and then, when, you, then you, when the guys are, you know, a lot of the listeners out there would be, and I know this because I was 
when I taught it in a workshop last week over in New Zealand, I, I sort of got this question, this objection pop up, you know, well, you know, I'm a plumber or I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a graphic designer. What sort of, what sort of call to action could I possibly have that would make people want to, you know, download that? And, you, and, you, and this is where you can get really creative with these things. Like if you, you know, if you've got a cool, you know, a, a business, I mean, everyone has something of something that people are interested in. Otherwise, you wouldn't be in business in the first place. So, I mean, why do people come to you? Why do people, you know, pick up the phone and call you? What is it they're typically after? You know, you can easily put that into a, you know, a document of some description, you know, the five reasons why, five ways you can save on power in your home. You know, if somebody comes yeah. to your home and you're an electrician, then why wouldn't they want to do that? Why wouldn't they want to download that document? Yeah, yeah, the seven steps to building your first home or the seven steps to... Yeah. It could be anything like that. I mean, I listened to one of your podcasts the other day with, the people from the heat of people from the yep. states. Yep. You know? I mean, they've got a whole industry built around that whole thing. Information. Yep. Right. People are looking for information to make things easier, and it, it can't be rubbishy information. That's the, that's the biggest thing I can say about that. Is if you're going to give them an offer, make it something that's going to use that they can. You know, it could be a checklist or you know, infographic or uh, something that consume. Can consume very very easily within the first five minutes, you know. Yep. Uh, because you don't. In a lot of cases, you give them an ebook, and if it's a thirty page ebook, unless it's riveting all the way through, you know, they're going to download it, put it in a file, and maybe never open it again. But if you can get them to consume it in the first five minutes, yeah, you, you know, a good a good, like I say, a low risk, high value type offer. One of the good ones we actually came up with last week um, from one of our builder customers. He, um, you know, we were doing a bit of brainstorming on this and. Um, and he's been struggling with this for a little while, so it was a bit of a revelation, I think, for for him when he came up with the idea of instead of like people, he he does uh, his renovation. He's a renovation expert, basically. Um, but he gets a lot of people that are coming to him, and they're not what he would consider qualified at that point to you know sort of have the conversation like to move forward. So what he really liked to do is get them qualified. So what he came up with was an idea of how he can you know send out a checklist to his customers to say, well, once you've this is basically the first step in working with us. This is what you need to do. Have you done this? 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 And all this is in place. Then um, come to us, and we can and we can definitely start working together or put something together. So just a little thing like that is a really good way to a get people engaged because if they're coming to you, they typically want a service or, or you know something that you're offering. And um, secondly, it's a way that you can keep start communicating with them and start building that uh, that dialogue. So. Yeah. Yep. Just having the, and and again, like you said, if you can qualify them beforehand, that's great. It's a great little tool. Yep. Yep. The next part was really, you know, once you've got that message right, is getting that medium right. Yeah. And I don't know if you know Pete Godfrey, but I remember years ago I was working with Pete Godfrey. Um, he was Australia's number one copywriter there for a while. Okay. Um, but you know, he he always said one was an evil number. You know, one leg of marketing is an evil number. You know, if that leg of marketing falls over. You know, the marketing, you imagine it's like a table. You've got a one-legged table. If the center leg falls over, the table's on the deck. Well, the same is true with your marketing. And, um, I mean, I hear a lot of people that come to me and say, oh, you've got plenty of marketing. I've got word of mouth and it's all great. Now, I remember two years ago, uh, <laughs> some people up in the Gold Coast that I was talking to, they just didn't have any referral work. They'd been two years on one job and yeah. uh, they got off the end of that job and they had no referral work. And yeah. their whole business was based around word of mouth marketing for years before that. But, um, you know, things were tied in the Gold Coast at that time. Nothing was really moving. And yep. so um, they had no legs of marketing. So basically it was back to square one. Yep. And so so part of the idea of the buyer's journey is you want to be able to pick and choose your buyers. Mm-hmm. And when you're doing one leg of marketing, it tends not to give you much scope to be able to do that. So you want to have multiple ways of attracting people. And, and so imagine if you've got that table and you're shoving now four legs under it, it's still a bit wobbly. But once you start shoving five or six, seven legs of marketing underneath there, so it could be things like around your social, like your website stuff, you know, around your social media, your, your Google AdWords, Facebook ads, it could be, you know, uh, marketing pieces like that. But then you've got TV, radio, and a lot of the old stuff is working, especially now that some of the posts in Australia post, you know, three times a week, it's a surprise to get anything decent in there. <laughs> in a letterbox anymore, you know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, you know, once you can get people onto your, your buyer's journey, picking up your lead magnet, you know they're interested. Yep. Then, like we'll talk about in the next step, is qualifying them. Then we can qualify them properly to put them to where they are on your buyer's journey. And there's a couple of things that are good about that because if you get somebody in there that's not your ideal target market or not right for you now, 
why not turn them into a referral? Exactly. By turning around and saying, like, okay, let's say you're a builder. We'll use builders because that's probably the, you know, they're doing three, four hundred thousand dollar jobs, right? Mm-hmm. And you've got this guy that comes on and wants to get a, a, a door hung. Well, ideally, you have a strategy set up with a guy that might be a handyman. Yeah. And you get them to do the, the job. And what you do is you set up this referral strategy with the handyman and you say to the person, this, let's say it's, out, for instance, like Mr. And Mrs. Smith has just rung up, they want a door hung. Sorry, Mr. And Mrs. Smith, we don't do that, but he's a great guy. John yep. logs from ABC, whatever he does. Uh, he's the guy that you need to talk to. But at the same time, you turn around and say, that's not the type of work we do, but the type of work we do is, you know, high-end renovations. So uh, if you like, what I'd like to do is send you some information about that, put them on your buyer's journey is what you're really doing. Mm-hmm. Send them out some information and then turn around and say, oh, by the way, if you didn't have I'm to be talking to anybody that's looking for that type of work. Hey, please be the first to, to please refer us sort of thing. Now, you put a better process around that, but the idea of it is it's called the law of reciprocity. Mm-hmm. You've helped somebody else. So they're sitting down having a coffee with someone and they're talking about, I can't find a builder. He won't turn, return me um, calls and that sort of stuff. And they're having a the coffee with the person. Who, oh, I just spoke to this guy. He's given me the referral of a, of a handyman, but he doesn't do that sort of work, but he does your type of work. Here you go. You've got yep. a $300,000 job. So, yeah. You know, it's about being a little bit more, I suppose, not so much creative, but thinking a little bit further than Lateral. just the next job. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh, look, I, I, I mean, I've, I reckon I've built my entire business from that sort of that sort of model, to be honest. I mean, it's it's something that works so well. Um, I think people get sometimes t- caught up and tied up in that whole mindset of, you know, if I have to, if I want to market my business, I need to be spending a lot of money, which is v- very often not the case. You know, if you can just do it a little bit smarter, you often find, and you know, it's not about yeah, the money; well, it's just about the the strategy behind it. The whole cracks catch cry of our business is to work smarter, not harder. You know, you know, at the end of the day, you know, the guys are out there swinging the hammer, spinning that spanner, whatever it is they do, and they they're working 60, 70, 80 hours a week. I mean, I've got clients that down to the you know twenty, thirty hours a week. Danny, I think I was talking to you about Danny the other day. Is a TV repair guy that I work with. He's been with me for nine years. He's got four businesses, making a bucket load of money just building a $2 million house on the water to stand the roadie. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. And he doesn't do, he's like the last time he did a 40 hour week, probably counted on your hands in the last 12 months. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. It's And it's funny that example that you're using there about um, partnerships, because that was one thing that we, you know, we, we try and help a lot of companies establish. Firstly, you got to help them get through the barrier of, well, no, this is me, and I, I need to do this on my own. Because it's very often not the case. You've, you, I mean, as tradies, you're sitting there in, a, in an opportunity, in a market opportunity, with people that you know have the same audience as you. Um, they typically would probably have a very similar size business. I mean, we've helped a, 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 a an electrician um, client of ours pretty much overnight double their database by connecting them with a plumber of a similar size and just putting together a bit of a strategy together. Like it's really yeah. it's really not rocket science. Don't go to the ECHO meetings, go to the master plumbers meetings if you're yeah. you know, for for plumbing work. You know, if you're looking for plumbers or you know, that sort of work. You know, look at your different trades. I mean again another segment we're gonna be doing is about finding people, but you know don't hang around with all the same people. Try and find some other people that are working with your same clients. Yeah. What about some of the bottlenecks that people might typically face, I suppose, when it comes to trying to stand out from their competition? Like, there must be a few frustrations and things that might pop up. Yeah, yeah. So I, suppose, I suppose going back to that marketing triangle, we, I'd only touched on it, and this is probably a good segue straight into identifying your target market. And it's, it's really about the bottleneck is understanding your target market, mm-hmm. right? Who are they? Where, are, where do you find them? And then you build an avatar for for them, you know, like an avatar being, it might be, like I was saying before, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Yeah. Uh, they might be a certain age group. They might live in a certain area. They've got a certain type of, uh, they might have children. Or, but you really try to build the avatar so you can actually name that avatar. But then the next step is you really, the bottleneck, I suppose, in this whole process is really identifying their fears and frustrations, wants and aspirations, really. It's really, once you know your target market clearly, then you can build your message right and find out. You can also look at your point of difference. If you know who your target market is, you can start and tie everything together. So identifying their fears and frustrations, you know, things like um, um, frustrations in the industry. Let's say people not turning up, you know. Uh, yeah, getting overcharged, warranties, all sorts of yeah, things. Yeah, overcharging, warranties, all those sort of things. But, you know, one of the biggest frustrations I see here all the time from people is I can't get the- the tradesperson to turn up. I can't get the contractor to turn up. You know, they never return my phone calls. Okay, so a point of difference could be you address those problems or the fears and frust- or the 
frustrations those people are having in your marketing. Yep. But but put the systems in place to make sure you do turn up. Yep. Put the systems in place to be able to do that. But you know, make a list of those things and address so that you can address those. And then fears that they might have. You know, like some of the biggest fears people have with um, with working with builders and contractors. Practice, you know, yeah. Uh, especially on big jobs, you know, if they're working on a big job, what's what's the biggest fear of a builder? You know, are they going to turn up? Uh, sorry, are they going to go broke? Yeah. Well, firstly, are they going to turn up? Are they going to go broke? Or am I going to end up on TV on a current affair or you know, <laughs> news because I've got this cowboy builder that's just done me in? You know. So you know, you work, work out what the fears and frustrations are, and once you can identify them, then you start to pull your marketing apart and make that marketing stand out make you stand out from the crowd because everybody else is out there talking about free quotes and um you know on time and on budget and all that sort of stuff where you're talking about things that are that they, they've got frustrations in they've got fears in and even that downloadable report can address some of those things absolutely or even a q even a faq page you know like it's yeah. something that <clears throat> we're starting to implement a bit more of is that faq page because when people do come to you with questions or even in the stage where you might be sending out a proposal you know it, it often pays to you know post a link to that page so people can kind of address those questions before they arise yeah well and, and that's another thing with your marketing it's better to educate them about what you want about the about who you're looking for as the ideal client, like you were saying about that builder over and uh, when you went skiing, you know, qualifying the builder. Well, why not educate them on that? And the other side of it is, you know, people don't understand what goes on with some of this stuff in the marketplace. They yeah. don't understand. Um, they might it might be their first time at building, or their first time at using. Uh, you know, let's say it's um, even just a heater sort of thing. My brother does heating and cooling work. You know, he, he's a uh, he does some um, air conditioning and um, pool heating and all that sort of stuff as well. Yep. And so he's started to educate the clients, his clients, on you know what regular maintenance does, why they need to have regular maintenance and that sort of stuff. And and at the same time, not actually bagging other people in the industry, but it's you know it's been said in this industry that people do this and they don't do that. And so he shows them a couple of little videos on his mm-hmm. website on what you know people have done and why he, why his service is different. So a bit like. Like an FAQ page only with videos. And look, that's I think that's important. Well, for a number of reasons. Firstly, it, you don't need to go out there bagging people. I'm not. And I'm not saying that's what you just said, but I think if you can even get in the habit of starting to communicate with people, like I mean, through video tutorials is perfectly, especially if you've got like a visual product like your brother. Um, I mean, the, the reality behind the situation is your competition aren't doing it. So immediately by doing something like that, you're standing out from the competition, and you, <laughs> I mean, you're doing exactly what we're talking about. <laughs> Yeah, it's back back to you know, step one, point of difference. Yeah. You know? It's all little things that make the difference. And, and I suppose that's the thing. And I, I'm, like I said, I'm not bagging the – you never ever bag your competition. You know, you might bag the industry because, I mean, there is cowboy builders. There wouldn't be TV shows called cowboy builders if there wasn't. So, <laughs> so educate them on what goes wrong, you know. Uh, I mean, I know from I, – I got into um, working with builders and contractors through a couple of different things and mainly, uh, I mean – I'm a mechanic by trade. My family are all tradies and that. But uh, I worked on Parliament House for a number of years when they were building that. So that kind of puts them, puts everybody in perspective of how old I am. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we won't go there. <clears throat> but you know, um, having <clears throat> having that, having moved from that into doing property development and that, and working with syndicates, we did over thirty million dollars worth of work in syndicates. And yeah, the builders out there, the poor poor guys are getting hammered, and they just had you know they were. Going broke, and you, you're going, you're going in as a developer trying to get a price on a product, and there's got these guys coming in, they they, they give you a price, and the next thing they're trying to make it up with variations, and there's oh, so yeah. much Good rubbish grief. in the industry. So, yeah. <clears throat> what I'm saying is, you don't have to bag your competition, but the industry is ripe of it, you know. So just like I said, you, it's just educating your client on what can go wrong in the industry, and what they can face, and that's again, like you said, putting up your FAQs. Greg, let's wrap this episode up uh, now, and then we are going to come back with the following episode, which is going to be how to qualify prospects to stop wasting your time. So, um, mate, thanks for joining us on the microphone, and uh, we'll talk to you again shortly. All right. Yeah. Okay, good stuff. Okay, thanks, man. Thank you for listening to another episode of Toolbox Talks. If you're liking what you hear, then you can head across to the siteshed.com where you can join our community by signing up to our Toolbox Talks, uh, you'll get sent a weekly 
notification, which is basically a highlight of everything that we've spoken about during that week, along with any other industry news that may be relevant or specific to the trades. If you're enjoying the show, you can head across to iTunes, Stitcher, or SoundCloud, where you can leave us a review. Uh, That would be fantastic, and all the reviews get read out in the show. Uh, Likewise, if you have any friends or colleagues that you think would benefit from the show and the, the episodes that we create, then please go ahead and share it with them.